I've been in church all my life, and um, even when I didn't think of myself as a Christian, I still went. Partly because my father was a pastor. He still is, actually. He tried to retire, but um, they wouldn't let him. Um, <laughs> he's a pastor. Uh, so it was expected of me in, in my family. Um, but also because it was the thing to do. And the thing that I've come to know for a fact is that with the endless carousel of sermons, it is so easy to forget where we started and what the point of the series is. So in case you've already forgotten, the series is called Missing Pieces. And um, right at the start of this series, I said that it is an important thing for any congregation member, in fact, I believe it is a growth step for any congregation member to know the limitations of his or her leader. It is important to know that no matter how gifted you think your leader is, he or she does not possess all the pieces that the congregation needs to thrive or grow. God has gifted each one of you with an entire set of gifts and influence that your leader does not have. Each one of you is essentially God's missing piece. Now, we started out the series talking about idealists, people who are idealists and who question the status quo. The Bible calls them prophets. We followed that up by talking about people who are entrepreneurial and who seek out opportunities where other people might see obstacles. The Bible calls those people apostles. Last week, we talked about recruiters and raconteurs and motivators. The Bible calls them evangelists. And at each one of these stops, I've tried to speak honestly about the fact that because I'm the kind of person that is an idealist and I question the status quo, it kind of makes me bad at other things. And I've never been in, under any illusions about this. When we started Pivot 613, I knew then, as I know now, that I was going to need other people if I was to ever see anything happen. And this month, as we've walked through this series, my sincere prayer has been that each one of you finds your gifting or your place or your space and fans it into flame as you step up your involvement in God's work all around us. Now, lest I come across as being the person who invented these uh, offices in the church, let's read from a letter in the Bible uh, where Paul writes to a church in Ephesus about the unity among the followers of Christ and all the ways in which Christ expresses himself through people in order that the church is built up. Ephesians 4, we'll start at verse 1. In light of all of this, here's what I want you to do. While I'm locked up here, a prisoner for the master, I want you to get out there and walk, better yet, run on the road God called you to travel. I don't want any of you sitting around on your hands. I don't want anyone strolling off down some path that goes nowhere. And mark that you do this with humility and discipline, not in fits and starts, but steadily pouring yourselves out for each other in acts of love, alert at noticing differences, and quick at mending fences. You were all called to travel on the same road and in the same direction, so stay together both outwardly and inwardly. You have one master, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father over all, who rules over all, works through all, and is present in all. Everything you are and think and do is permeated with oneness. But that doesn't mean that you should all look and speak and act the same. Out of the generosity of Christ, each of us is given his own gift. The text for this is, he climbed the high mountain, he captured the enemy and seized the booty, he handed it all, he handed it all out in gifts to the people. Is it not true that the one who climbed up also climbed down, down to the valley of earth? And the one who climbed down is the one who climbed back up, up to highest heaven. He handed out gifts above and below, filled heaven with his gifts, filled earth with his gifts. He handed out gifts of apostle, prophet, evangelist, and pastor teacher to train Christ's followers in skilled servant work, working within Christ's body, the church, until we're all moving rhythmically and easily with each other, efficient and graceful in response to God's Son, fully mature adults, fully developed within and without, fully alive like Christ. No prolonged infancies among us, please. 
will not tolerate babes in the woods, small children who are an easy mark for imposters. God wants us to grow up, to know the whole truth and tell it in love like Christ in everything. We take our lead from Christ who is the source of everything we do. He keeps us in step with each other. His very breath and blood flow through us, nourishing us so that we will grow up healthy in God, robust in love. The whole letter to the, Ephesian, to the Ephesians was written clearly um, a while after Paul had been with them. You see, Paul had lived in Ephesus for about three years. And in those three years, he, he started the congregation to which he wrote this letter. Now, Paul never returned to Ephesus after he lived with them. In fact, when he writes this letter, he's in prison. And soon after that, he was executed. And so one of the things that he does in this letter, and he does it with, with in, in, in almost all his letters, is that he gives a template from which you can understand how God has uniquely designed his people and gifted his people to work together. You see, the systems that humans tend to set up are hierarchical. Whether we like it or not, we always end up building systems where a small handful of people hold most of the information and influence. You can see it in every system that we've built, even the church. But the thing that was revolutionary about the Jesus movement, and it is something that Paul saw so well as he observed the way the Holy Spirit works, is that God works through everybody. As Paul saw it, everyone that was a follower of Christ was uniquely gifted and important and had an integral contribution to the life and health of his or her congregation or community. And this is a revolutionary idea that is unique to the Church of Christ. And if you read any of the other writers of the New Testament, they all echo the same sentiment. There is a very clear sense that God does not centralize his gifts and power in just one individual. But out of his great love for us, he gifts each one of us uniquely in order that each one of us may make a significant contribution to the grand tapestry that he is weaving. Each one of us is God's missing piece. And you can see it clearly in this passage. He handed out gifts of apostle, prophet, evangelist, and pastor teacher to train Christ's followers in skilled servant work, working within Christ's body, the church, until we're all moving rhythmically and easily with each other, efficient and graceful in response to God's Son, fully mature adults, fully developed within and without, fully alive like Christ. Um, many of you know this. In 2003, I moved from being a volunteer at the church that I was attending to become uh, one of the staff members. The gentleman that hired me was very clear about the fact that I was not to be a pastor. Um, I was not expected to do pastor things. And he did that for two reasons. The first is that um, the denomination that I was a part of had very clear guidelines about who could be a pastor, and I clearly did not meet those guidelines or qualifications. Uh, but second and more importantly, he saw that I was not a good pastor. So. He didn't expect me to do pastor things. But over the years, my role and position changed. And um, I moved from that church to another church, and people started calling me pastor and expecting me to fill the role that a pastor should, feel, should fill. You see, the word pastor is another way of saying shepherd. In fact, if you look through the Bible and if you read through various translations, you find that they use the word pastor and shepherd interchangeably. And in our 21st century context where we're very familiar with the concept of having a church in every neighborhood, the job of the church leader tends to be one that, is, that looks very much like shepherding. So let's define a shepherd. A shepherd is a nurturer, a social integrator. A shepherd focuses on the living, on the healthy living of the community. Um, and focuses on making sure that they stick together in a loving and wholesome way. And so you'll find that most men and women who lead congregations fit this mold to a T. A gift that you find in tandem with shepherding is teaching because part of the process of building a healthy community is the instruction that needs to go towards making it a reality. And so you'll find that many shepherds are also good teachers who not only nurture their communities, 
but teach them about the nuts and bolts of the thing that they're forming or sustaining. Now, I want to be very clear about something. Please hear me. The office of shepherds and teachers in the church in the past has been something that has been confined to the leadership. But if you look back at the passage that we read, there is no mention of the fact that shepherds and teachers, or for that matter, apostles, prophets, evangelists, are restricted only to the leadership of the church. If we properly understand what Paul is saying, then you have to acknowledge that these gifts express themselves in people, different people, regardless of the position that they hold. I'll give you an example. At my previous job as the music director, I was the idealistic one on the team. My pastor, my boss, was a very good pastor and teacher. He is a very good pastor and teacher. Now, on one of my teams, there was a lady that played piano. She was a visionary. She is a visionary. And she dreamed up, uh, and she dreamed up and muscled into existence something called the Big Give. Some of you may have heard of it. It's an event every summer where churches give away thousands and thousands of items to people in their communities. And last Sunday, no, not last Sunday, last summer, there were over 75 churches involved in this initiative, and it actually made the CTV news. This was started by someone who played piano on one of my teams. While all of this was happening, we watched a little girl, nine-year-old girl, come to the church by herself and then bring her whole family and friends and neighborhood, and they took over an area of seating in the, con in the church. She could make invitations that most of us could not. And in the simplicity of that nine-year-old's invitation, the lives of so many people were changed. As I said, these gifts are not the sole property of the leaders of the congregation, because that's the way God works. Shepherds and teachers are so needed in every organization. If you have apostles and prophets leading the sh running the show, uh, and you don't have the support of shepherds and teachers, you end up creating a driven and demanding and even insensitive ethos. If your organization is dominated by evangelists, you end up with organizations that look amazing and huge, but they have no depth to them. Shepherds and teachers, because of their bent towards inclusiveness and collaboration, they help to ground the groups that they are a part of. They help to provide the social lubricant that is needed to make movements work. And they help to, move, move, they help to take movements from being simply conceptual to actually being practical and pragmatic. Shepherds and teachers are great at cultivating um, and integrating people into a socially cohesive community. Because of that, shepherds and teachers help their congregations and communities to achieve greater harmony, to love each other, and in the church, they help us to take time to love and know God. You see, for the first part of the 20th century, the North American church experienced an unprecedented growth. And the thing that was needed to ground this rapidly expanding movement um, was the office of shepherds and teachers. They helped to establish the church and helped us to move from being just a movement that was a wildfire to actually thinking deeply about matters of faith. And even to this day, you will find, I'm telling you, just ask anyone who's been a part of the church, you will find that they have a story of some insignificant person who, insignificant in quotes, some person who had no leadership position at the congregation who actually taught them about the Bible. You'll hear it all the time. I had a Sunday school teacher, I had a small group leader, I had a friend who taught me about the Bible and taught me how to grow in God. To this day, you'll find them in congregations all over the world. They don't need a title to connect with people. They don't need an official role to help growing Christians connect with the Bible. And I envy such people. 
because I don't have the patience to be a teacher. I'm too prickly to be a properly nurturing person. I'm too idealistic to always remember to seek out harmony. And I find myself speaking more in terms of rhetoric than in substance. And all of these things conspire to make me a not so good pastor and teacher. But you know what the awesome thing is? I don't have to be good at any of these things. I don't. The fact of the matter is that some of you listening to me are exactly like this. Where I am terrible at moving from rhetoric to action steps, you are great at it. Where I'm weak at seeking harmony and being nurturing, you are great at it. Where some of us may be quick to run off to the next thing, you are our gravity boots that help to keep us grounded. Where some of us may miss opportunities to show love, you are great at making the unseen connections that provide the social glue that every community needs. You are our shepherds. You are our teachers. And we need you. You are God's missing pieces. And I believe that his call on you, and as a matter of fact, on all of us, people like me and people like you that are a part of this thing, is to give more than what is convenient. If you are the kind of person that likes to make sure that people experience a sense of belonging and connectedness, if you are the kind of person that likes to make sure that there is engagement and consistency in this movement and in other things you are involved with, we need you here at Pivot 613. You are our missing pieces. Just like the out-of-the-box thinkers, the idealists, the join-the-party people, we need that unique touch that you bring to round out this thing that God is building. See, Pivot 613 is about one thing and one thing only. We would like to see the stories of people's lives changed by grace and mercy and love. We're in the business of helping people and communities put down fear, judgment, and condemnation because these three things precipitate the worst about humanity. The only way that any of us can break out of our cycles of despair is when we embrace the grace and mercy and love of Christ. This is what we believe. This is our mission. This is the reason why we started in the first place. Now, it is a very simple proposition, but it is a tough one to live out. Because for many of us, we'd rather remain in the childish state of fear and judgment. I'm sorry if I'm being tough here, but it's true. People would rather hang on to judgment which precipitates prejudice and malice. People would rather hang on to condemnation, which precipitates unforgiveness and small-mindedness. I was talking to a friend the other day, and she said to me, do you think people can really change? Because I don't. And when she said this, everything in me just screamed, no! Because I actually believe that people can change. I actually believe that if people choose love, instead of fear, they set their lives on a completely different trajectory. If people choose to extend the same grace that Christ has shown us instead of judgment, they end up creating completely different realities for themselves. And if people choose mercy instead of condemnation, they become such remarkably different people that they're almost unrecognizable. I believe that lives can change, futures can change, and people can change just by these three words. I've seen it happen in my own life. And it is this transformation that we're about at Pivot 613. The reason I've invited each one of you to step up and consider giving more than what is convenient is because I really want you to join with God on this journey. Please join the party. Please come play with us. If you are inclusive and collaborative, join us. If you are prescriptive and analytical, we need you. If you are design-focused and strategic, we have many jobs for you to do. If you are persuasive or demonstrational or motivational, we need your infectious energy and drive. We need you all because each one of you is God's missing piece. Each one of you is needed to help us see our vision become a reality. 
This Missing Pieces series has been about making an invitation to step off the sidelines and to bring the totality of who you are to what God is doing. It is an invitation to be a front row observer to the change that happens in people's lives when they walk away from fear. It is an invitation to join all that you are with all of who God is and watch what happens. Each one of you is needed because we need to see people move from the cringing, fearful state of childishness into the fully mature state of grace and love. Paul put it so eloquently in this passage we just read. Verse 14, no prolonged infancies among us, please. We'll not tolerate babes in the woods, small children who are an easy mark for imposters. God wants us to grow up, to know the whole truth and tell it in love like Christ in everything. We take our lead from Christ, who's the source of everything we do. He keeps us in step with each other. His very breath and blood flow through us, nourishing us so that we will grow up healthy in God, robust in love. My friends, allow me to get a little bit mushy here for a minute. I love you all, and I care about you. I care for you. I'm not always good at showing it, but I want you to know it. I see in each one of you an incredible amount of potential, and I'm almost impatient for you to realize it because God has uniquely designed you to make a difference in every sphere of your life. Now, if you're like me, it is so easy to look at your life and wonder how in the world God is going to do something great through you, but you have no idea. You don't hold the master plan. You don't hold the grand design. What you do is you step off the sidelines in faith and you hand who you are to God and then watch him blow your mind. I've seen it happen in my life more times than I can count and it amazes me every single time that with all my flaws and my shortcomings, God still chooses to use me. God chooses you. God chooses you. You are his missing pieces. So I invite you, step up. Trust him with your life. Give more than what is merely convenient. And watch what happens. Watch what happens. Amen. <laughs>